the supposed murder of Dr. Parkman. The afflicting topic of my last two letters continues to occupy public attention here to the exclusion of almost every other subject of present moment. Further developments do not relieve Professor Webster from the mesh of suspicious circumstances in which the unhappy man is involved. Let me briefly state the authentic facts that have appeared up to this afternoon. Professor Webster states that on Friday, November 23rd, Dr. Parkman called at the medical college and was paid by him, Webster, $483.64, which amount was to take up two notes and cancel a mortgage. On the morning of that same day, Professor Webster had called at Dr. Parkman's house, and the doctor being out had left word for him that he would pay him if he would call at his room at the college soon after 1 o'clock p.m. Since half past one on that day, when Dr. Parkman was seen by a number of people to enter the college, no reliable information of him has been obtained. All reports of his being seen here and there turn out to be fallacious. He was seen to go into the college, but was not seen to come out. On Tuesday last, November 27th, the medical college was searched, and the search included the apartments of Professor Webster. Nothing to implicate him was found. Suspicions continued to increase, however, and the people in the neighborhood of the college clung to the idea that the college was responsible. Anxious to satisfy the public distrust, Dr. Henry J. Bidgelow, professor of surgery at Harvard University, renewed the search. A vault under the laboratory of Professor Webster was broken into and a portion of a human body drawn forth. The fact was deemed sufficient to authorize the arrest of the professor, and he was accordingly arrested at his house in Cambridge on Friday evening, November 30th. In order to avoid alarming his family, the officer simply told him that he was wanted at the college to aid in the search. It was not till the carriage drove up to the jail and he was told that he was arrested that he betrayed emotion. Then his anguish was intense and indescribable. He was soon after visited by Mr. Parker, the county attorney, and other citizens. Mr. Parker addressed him kindly, advised him to say nothing while laboring under his appalling state of excitement, and expressed the pain which his own duty now entailed upon him. At about eleven o'clock he was taken by the officers to the college. He was so weak that he had to be borne bodily to the carriage. Being confronted with the mutilated remains that had been discovered and brought from his laboratory, he seemed struck with frenzy but said nothing. Water being offered him, the sight seemed to throw him into convulsions, as if he were laboring under a paroxysm of hydrophobia. Since that time, his sufferings have been unspeakable, and he has been unable to retain anything on his stomach. On Saturday afternoon, further discoveries were made at the college, among them that of a tea chest in the professor's laboratory, which chest being empty, the trunk and right thigh of a human body rolled out upon the floor. A large knife, the blade of which bore unquestionable evidence of the partial erasure of blood by some chemical substance, was also discovered. The remains in the tea chest were found to correspond with those found in the vault. In the grate used by Professor W., some artificial teeth, small particles of bone, and bits of fused gold and silver with some buttons were found. A jury of inquest have been sworn who will make the report on Wednesday. The Honorable Franklin Dexter has been retained as counsel for Professor W.